It is my pleasure to present to you Glenn Eiffel. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the good news is that Athelia is one of my dearest friends. The better news is that she could have said so much more about me. <laughs> and I am so deeply relieved that she didn't. <laughs> Thank you for having me here tonight. I am thrilled, honored, and happy to see all your faces, even though I can't see them, which is a good thing. I, I hate Dan Perkins, because that was a really good speech. That's what I whispered in his ear when I shook his hand. And one never wants to follow such a thing. but. I'm here because I love journalism, and I love journalists, and that's why I'm honored and I'm humbled to be here and to deliver a, a lecture named after a man I so admired, Herb Block. On the rare occasions when I'm given a scarcely deserved opportunity like this, I'm at first convinced that someone has made a terrible mistake. After a Saturday Night Live parodied me twice after the vice presidential debates, I became persuaded that people really invited me places because they thought I was Queen Latifah. <laughs> and if I visited college campuses, I figured it was because they knew that I knew Jon Stewart. <laughs> but little did they, any of them know that it's even better than that. I actually knew her block. Of course, I have the anecdote. You see, any reporter who worked at the Washington Post newsroom during the time that Herb was there tells pretty much the same story. There are probably people in the audience tonight who were not along as I tell it. It goes like this. If you were fortunate enough as a reporter to be working on what the news of the day was, in my case, politics, at some point, usually late in the afternoon, Herb would come shuffling out of his office, and he would be right on deadline for you, of course. But he, when he was approaching, he had in his hand usually a draft of the next day's cartoon. At this point, you thought, deadlines be damned. You snapped to attention. Because Herb was in the process of fact-checking. It was a skill some reporters should embrace a little bit more of these days, but that's <laughs> another conversation, another speech. For me, it was like sitting at the knee of a journalistic idol. Perhaps it was because everybody Every one of us, at some point in kindergarten, we do, or when we doodle our way through boring meetings, we all think, we all thought we could draw. Kind of like thinking that you can do what Renee Fleming does because you once sang in the church choir. <laughs> she could sing, you probably can't, not really. He was an artist, you're probably not really. <laughs> so Herb would ask your advice, and you'd think to yourself, I'm not worthy, or Alternatively, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And then he would nod thoughtfully, and he would shuffle away, either in search of another opinion, wisely, or satisfied that he'd landed where he needed to be. He was usually just looking for accuracy. But you never really knew whether he listened to and took your advice until you saw the newspaper the next day, not online, but actually in your hand. Herb loved news. He loved news reporters, and he loved newsrooms, and so do I. Herblock and I had absolutely nothing in common when you look at the face of it. He was an elderly white man. I was a young black woman at the time, young. <laughs> but that was only looking at the surface. What Herb possessed and what I still strive for every day is humanity. Herb knew when to laugh because, of course, Washington, you must admit, can be absurd. When Bill Clinton was elected president in November 92, he drew a picture of a man in a plaid shirt standing at what may have been his front lawn, staring up at a huge globe being rolled out of the back of a huge dump truck as the delivery man asked, your name Clinton? <laughs> and Herb was prescient. In another cartoon, he sketched a somber looking anchor man reading the news. Over his shoulder was a map of Iran, and he was saying, and now the latest from Tehran. The year was 1979. But most of the time, even when he used a light touch, he was actually deadly serious. 
1953, when Joseph Stalin died, the draw his drawing was of a Soviet strongman literally taking a walk with death. Stalin with a bloodstained sickle in his hand and the Grim Reaper with his own curved blade over his shoulder. And the Reaper was saying to Stalin, you are always a great friend of mine, Joseph. And of course, he just loved Richard Nixon. <laughs> but he also worried that children were starving somewhere and that young people were dying in dubious wars or not getting educated and that politicians were lying. Some people wrote about it, he drew about it. I would leave, love to see now what he would think of the business he loves so much now. In so many instances, the definition of journalism has become perverted. Some people think anyone with a suit and a tie talking into a camera is actually a journalist. Other things, others think it's someone pounding a table so hard that they wouldn't be able to hear the answer even if they got one. Some people think it's crowdsourcing, where a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about get together online and make things up. We saw that last week with the Boston bombings, and that really worked well. <laughs> there are times, as a result, when I do despair just a little bit. Last year, I visit a lot of college campuses, and last year I met a college freshman who told me that she really wanted to be a journalist, and she was very excited to meet me. It became clear what she really wanted to be was on television, but I asked her, why? And she said, because I love to talk. I just talk, and I talk, and I talk. <laughs> And then she proceeded to talk and talk and talk <laughs> until I stopped and interrupted her politely, I thought, and asked her, so do you listen to? And she was baffled. No one had ever, ever asked her that question before. Her professor was sitting across the stable from me looking a little abashed. But I felt much better last year when I, uh, when I went and and met, actually it was only last week, I was in Delaware, I met a high school student who told me she wanted to be a journalist too. And when I asked her why, she said because she loves to write, and she writes, and she writes, and she writes. I got that. I have always liked to write. It didn't matter that so few people in my chosen industry looked like me. Which brings us back to Herb. He had a special skill for reaching toward difference, not away from it. I got my first job in a newsroom in a way that Herb would have actually appreciated. It was at the Boston Herald American in 1977. It was my first time working in a real newsroom and I loved everything about it. I loved the smell of the ink, I loved the clatter of the wire machines, which of course I was in charge of ripping because I was at the lowest rung on the pole. I was making myself handy as, in any way that I could and as long as they let me hang around the hot type. But one day I arrived at work and I found a note waiting for me at my little workspace in the photo department. And it read, nigger go home, 1970s, Boston. Yes, it was shocking, but it tells you something about me that my first response was as a journalist. I picked it up and thought, I wonder who this is for. <laughs> My bosses knew who it was for. They felt bad about it. They offered me a job. It worked out. <laughs> I tell that story to help people focus the mind because it was not about the name that I was called or even my boss's reaction to it. It's about being aware of the world around you and deciding what you are willing to do about it. Herb knew what he wanted to do. Sometimes his cartoons were angry. Much of the time they weren't, but he was not. But in his mind, someone had to tell the story of the undereducated, expose the inequalities in the workplace, and expose corruption. Who better than a man with an inkwell? We as journalists have enviable access to events and the chance to ask questions and demand answers. That doesn't mean that we are annoying, although sometimes we are and have to be. It means that we have a responsibility to fulfill. It's the deal we cut when they let us in the door, when they let us sit in the front row of the news conferences. Whose stories can you tell? Whose voices are not being heard? Which stories and voices go unheard? And most of all, what are you willing to do about it? Her believed in the power of the pen to let people see more clearly. He had opinions, of course, but he wanted you to pause over the panel, think it through, and understand why he came to his conclusions, not just that he did. 
I'm frequently asked why I don't chase people around the table and force them to answer questions. I think this must be a daily question we get at the news hour. Why did you let that guy get away with saying X? It's because I think it's more useful for people to draw their own conclusions, not for me to force them to my point of view. The two vice presidential debates that you heard that I moderated convinced me that this is right. In the first one, with Dick Cheney and John Edwards, who I would ask different questions of today. <laughs> but I asked each one, I thought of a question that I thought maybe might be different, and I asked each one very specifically. I said, I want to talk to you about AIDS, but not about AIDS in Africa, about AIDS right here in America, and I cited the number of the skyrocketing number of heterosexual African-American women who were being infected with HIV. I specifically asked them to talk about the domestic crisis. John Edwards' response was, well, this is what I would do in Africa. <laughs> oh, right, I'm not supposed to talk about Africa. I think he said that. Dick Cheney's response was, oh, I didn't know that. Beginning and of response. Neither had the answer or really cared about the answer or the issue. And viewers at home, Afterward, they still tell me years later that they drew their own conclusions from that. They knew that if this was an important issue for them, that these were not people who, for whom it was important. I didn't have to drive that point home. In the second national debate I moderated between Joe Biden and Sarah Palin, I was surprised when the Republican nominee turned to me at one point and said, I don't have to answer the moderator's questions. <laughs> now, I had a couple of options here. <laughs> I could have said what went through my mind, which is, what? <laughs> which seemed inappropriate. I kind of saw the cat fight headlines the next day, so. <laughs> but I understood that if I let that pass, the viewers would figure out what that meant, too. It meant she had agreed to a debate and she didn't want to play by the rules. Now, not getting an answer doesn't mean you don't ask the question. It means you let people know that the people who would lead them won't answer the question. It means sometimes that things get messy, that questions don't get answered, that we are forced in a constant, into a constant state of uncertainty and inconclusion. But sometimes we have to wait because change doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it does, but mostly it happens over time and it seldom happens in an orderly manner. My favorite story about the value of the inconclusive and the disorderly can be found in the deeply reported research work, which probably lives here in the Library of Congress, called Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> it was one of my favorite books growing up. I think I found something appealing in the contrast between Pooh's nervous sunniness and Tigger's antic excitement and Eeyore's depressive nature which would prepare me for newsrooms to come. <laughs> Pooh's author, A.A. A. Milne, understood the benefits of this unlikely combination. One of, he wrote, one of the advantages of being disorderly is that one is constantly making exciting discoveries, which sounds like my desk at work. <laughs> I guess I'm a journalist because I always think there are new and exciting discoveries right around the corner. Discoveries in an age when everyone has an opinion, but so little is new and so much is trite. Discoveries in an age when we are bombarded with so much information and so little of it is news. Discoveries in a time when so much of what passes for inspiration lacks true insight. Discoveries that move us to seize responsibility rather than to grudgingly fulfill obligation. And discoveries in a time when we demand that right to ask questions which is where you're going to come in in a moment, because I look forward to your questions. But first, I'd like to end with one more story. It is about a friend, a woman of my age, my race, and my journalistic ambition, but with so much more vision and skill than I. She traveled the world. She covered South Africa when Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And, that, and, that, and then she covered Zaire when Mobutu Sese Seko ruled. She sat in living rooms in Miami public housing projects and she talked to crack addicts and she studied dance. Like Herb, she worked for many years at the Washington Post. Lynn Duke was a Renaissance woman. She passed away last weekend. 
Her Washington Post obituary quoted from an essay she wrote about her craft, our craft, and it seems fitting to read from that tonight. She wrote, I have always felt most at home as a journalist, for I believe that the practice of journalism isn't worth much unless one believes in its power to do good. So I have often sought stories where some good was needed, where, with luck, my journalism could bring change to someone's life. I think it's fair to say that that's the way that her block and the recipients of the prize he so generously endows tonight, I think that's the way they saw and see the world as well, and thank God for that. And thank you as well. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. I want to pull a Rubio here. Why don't you take your call? Thank you. Much better. Um, the lights have come up, and there are people with microphones who would love to take your questions, and I'll just take as many until they stop me. So uh, I'll just. There's somebody over there with their hand up, yeah. Ms. Eichel, if you could go back, knowing what you know now, and moderate any presidential <laughs> debate, <laughs> which one would it be and why? Any presidential debate? I'd like to go back to that Nixon-Kennedy debate. <laughs> I was, you know, not exactly old enough. But I think that we spent a lot of time in the years since that debate aired talking about Nixon's sweat and Kennedy's suavite. And the things we know now tells us how what really matters about the presidency and what we should be listening for. The decisions have so little to do with whether somebody sweats or not. In fact, you would like to think that they sweat less, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and also, we now know, looking back on history, which is no way you can know this, what would await this young president in the next several years. And we also knew, didn't know at the time, how close an election that would be, and therefore how pivotal that debate, that debate would be. So to have been on the stage, at a time like that would have been amazing, even though I have to tell you, the worst place to be during a presidential debate is on the stage. I had no idea that Sarah Palin was winking at the camera. <laughs> I knew none of this. Next question. Um, if. Oh, hi. Uh, Go ahead, it's you. Oh. What, if you what? have the mic, you got the question. <laughs> um, um, Ms. Eiffel? Oh. Well, now, of course, I spoke too soon. There are two mics. You, then you. <laughs> okay. Ms. Eiffel, um, what, if, what exactly, if you can recall, made you want to pursue a career in journalism? It's an excellent question. I, I grew up in a home where uh, my father was an ordained minister but also fancied himself a civil rights activist. I also grew up at a time in the 60s when the world seemed to be coming to us. It was very clear to me what the connection was between what was happening in the streets and how it would affect my life. We got two newspapers a day. We got the afternoon newspaper. We watched the news in the morning. Great, good, clean fun in our household was watching political conventions. <laughs> I swear, we were kind of nerdy, but it worked out once again. And as a result, I saw the connection between what the news was and what the world was, and I wanted to be there. Now, the truth is I love to write, I mentioned that, but I didn't know how to get anything done. So the idea of a deadline was very appealing. And once I saw that they had deadlines and bylines at newspapers, I knew I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. Um, uh, what do you think that Herb Block would say, based on how the foundation was developed and grown, what do you think that he would say if he was alive today and sitting in the audience? He would be so tickled. <laughs> he would be so tickled because here's the, the dirty little truth about Herb. Most of us had no idea that he had these resources or that he had this vision, but he had it and it was all in his will for what this would be. So what he would be is satisfied that what he left behind actually grew into what he wanted it to. Um, good evening, Mrs. Eiffel. Uh, my question is, 
How did you feel when you first was in front of the camera at PBS? What were your first thoughts? And as going through time, you know, you got used to it. What are your thoughts now on being in front of the camera? <laughs> Terror. Um, <laughs> my first time in front of the camera actually was working as a reporter um, in Baltimore, working on uh, showing up on a show called Maryland News Wrap, which was one of those wa Washington, one of those Washington Week type shows where you're a panelist. So I got to be really bad for a small audience for a while. But the real key came when I was hired to work at NBC News before I came to, to PBS because Tim Russert, the late Tim Russert, um, uh, had me as a guest on Meet the Press. And he liked me fine enough, but after a while he started saying, well, why don't you come work in television full time? And I said, oh no, I just, this is much more fun, this New York Times thing, I'm not working in television. I get phone calls returned if I show up in your show, but I get to actually do the work if I work for the New York Times. And then he dared me. What are you, a coward? You know, that kind of dare. So I, um, I took the leap. I, I, I was very polite to my editors at the New York Times in case I needed to crawl back for the, my job. And, and I took the leap to work for someone who made sure that I had an investment in my success, which I tell young people this all the time. He made sure that I learned television, which is a completely different craft than print. He learned, he told me, not, not just the lipstick, in the lipstick in the hair, but that's the hard part, but the rest of it too. He told me, he, he assigned me to a producer who could teach me the craft. And then when the opportunity came to have my own show and to work for PBS, and I was still under contract to NBC, he actually went to the bosses in New York and got me out of my contract so I could seize this opportunity that he knew would be good for me. So he was the best kind of mentor. He got me in, he got me out, and got me training. So uh, by the time I got to PBS and was on the air, it was not as frightening anymore. There's someone up front here. What, what? Yeah, yeah, whatever. There's someone over there and there's someone over here. How's that? I can see, you guys can't see. Kinda. And these will be the last two, so whoever's last, no pressure. <laughs> uh, if I could ask a question for Dan. Um, I'm one of the folks who pays $10 every six months to receive uh, my favorite thing about Friday is your email uh, with a cartoon that makes me feel better about the week. Um, how's that going? Is it, is it promising? Uh, no, I, I want, you, um, I want okay. you to make money and I want this to be sustainable. Well, How's okay, it working? So, this, um, so I, have to, uh, I have to do a complicated answer. Thank you for subscribing. I'm sorry for jumping in. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I talked a bit about the, the problems and, and the challenges and so forth, and I don't mean to make it sound like I'm just waiting around for someone to throw money at me. I'm trying to adapt like everyone else. Um, one of the things you'll hear a lot, uh, uh, online, I don't know how to, what, what should I say, enthusiasts will say, well, you just need to sell t-shirts or things like that. You know, there's only so many t-shirts you can sell. I've tried everything. Um, the one thing I've tried that this gentleman is a subscriber to is I send out my cartoon ahead of time. I have uh, an email list. People pay 10 bucks for six months. I send it out ahead of time. I, I write uh, a lot uh, with each email, and people seem to like it. It's going quite well. I seem to be holding on to subscribers, and I thank you for being one of them. Sorry. <laughs> so, so we're all going to sign up tonight, right? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Eiffel, I have a question. It was inspired by uh, your comments about your recently deceased friend who talked about journalism, going to journalism to do good, which obviously it's hard to criticize that. However, in recent years, I think there are a lot of people that think that reporters have begun to edit the news or to not cover news based upon their own personal uh, beliefs. My mind instantly went to Robert Novak, a, a political conservative, raking Ronald Reagan over the coals uh, during Iran-Contra. Um, this week in Philadelphia, there's an abortion trial that went completely uncovered. Um, Boy, I'm going to argue with you on that, but go ahead. Well, it went completely Just uncovered. Just tell me your question, and I'll well, be happy the, to answer. The, the question is, um, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the the, president, the vice presidential debate, where a, presidential, a vice presidential candidate uh, impregnated a woman. 
Um, that story was broken by the National Enquirer months and months and months earlier, and yet no, it, it, the mainstream media seemed to refuse to cover it. I wonder if you have any thoughts on... Uh, <laughs> I have a couple thoughts. Well... <laughs> now, you... I'll answer your question now, if you don't mind. Uh, and I, I, and I, I offer it very yeah. respectfully. No, I don't, I don't take it as anything but respectful, but I have lots of thoughts. Um, here's the thing. Um, there, you're right and you're wrong. The right part is that journalism has now become a silo business, where it's possible to turn on television in the morning and get someone who agrees with you, watch them from morning, noon through night, read only magazines and newspapers you agree with and come away without a single new piece of information in your mind, in your brain, in your thought wave that you didn't have when you woke up that morning, which I think is a shame. And that's for the left and the right. The other side of this, however, is that when people tell me that a story has gone entirely covered, I ask them how they know about it. And, and the, the way they know about it is because someone wrote about it. In the case of the Gosnell trial in Philadelphia, it was covered extensively in the Philadelphia media. It became a national story when interest groups whipped it into a frenzy and made it a story about abortion, and it has been extensively covered since then. The, the issue about John Edwards and his vice presidential campaign is that, I'm sorry, I'm not going to follow the National Enquirer. The National Enquirer does not have the same standards that true journalists have. It pays for news, which makes it suspect the information. Sometimes it happens to be true. That's nice when that happens, but it's not the way we do things. In addition to that, I also think that we have this, I don't know, it's a funny little rule, which is we want more than one person to tell us something. We want to get a second source on information. That way it's more likely to be true, less like, more likely to withstand uh, uh, sub to withstand questioning and to actually add something to the national debate. I think that if reporters who were covering the, the campaign at the time had reason to believe in real time that weapons of mass destruction weren't in Iraq or that John Edwards was uh, you know, sneaking around or any number of issues that we find out about improved to uh, within a fault years later. Today we just discovered, for instance, that Syria has made some use, we still don't know what, of chemical weapons. We decided not to do that story unless someone had soil samples to prove it. Now, it appears there, we don't know what the extent of it is, but we, have, we know that there's something going on because there is now proof should be, because of the rumors or because of the accusations, should we have run that story on page one because it may turn out to be true? I don't think so. So what I, what I find the, the greatest criticism that journalists get is from people who say, you don't tell the story my way. You don't tell my side of the story my way. And I don't think that's the standard that we're striving for. We're striving for a standard where we're going to get as close to the truth as possible, even though it's often elusive. I think we're done. Thank you so What? 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I, wait a second. I have, to, I have to interrupt myself because I'm about to get a really tough question from a nine-year-old. I know who it is. Thank you. Dad, can you share the tie? Can you share the tie? The tie? Remember? The tie shifts colors. He wants me to point this out. <laughs> Thank you.